The first uh, to talk is Carl from Team Houston 11, 13th floor. Uh, I asked him a week ago if uh, he's going to talk about this paper that he just published. He said no. And this other project panel? No. So, very productive Team Houston is going to talk about nucleosome turnstiles in, in yeast. Okay. All right, sure. Thanks for the intro. So, the eukaryotic genome is uh, packaged into these things called nucleosomes, and it's comprised of a histone optimer with 147 base pairs of DNA wrapped around it. And this forms the beads on a spring chromatin structure, which can then be packed into higher order chromatin structures. And in addition to their structural role, nucleosomes also play a role in regulating what is allowed to bind to DNA by occluding binding sites for things like transcription factors. So they don't just bind DNA indiscriminately, they actually have some specificity. For instance, there's a periodicity uh, that of dinucleotides that's preferred by the nucleosome, and this roughly corresponds to the way the DNA is wrapped around the histone. As well, they prefer to bind IgC content DNA sequences and prefer not to bind poly DABP tracks. And this is a sequence of a, a string of poly A's on one strand and poly Q's on the opposite strand. And this forms a rigid DNA structure, and it's thought that that's how uh, it prevents nucleosome binding because it can't be wound around the DNA or around the, the nucleosome. And many yeast promoters actually contain these sequence elements. So uh, there have been many models created to predict where nucleosomes will bind uh, in DNA sequence, but most of these are based off of in vitro uh, data. And there's still there's ongoing debate as to how much of this translates to in vivo. And if you look at uh, the binding sites for where the, the binding sites of nucleosomes, uh, both in vivo and in vitro. Let's see if that works. Yeah, um, So then you can see there's some uh, pretty big differences between the two. So these heat maps here show nucleosome occupancy across all the yeast promoters on this axis from minus 500 to plus 1,000 relative to the transcription start site. And here, uh, yellow indicates high nucleosome occupancy, and blue indicates low nucleosome occupancy. So you can see for both in vivo and in vitro, at the transcription start site, there's a nucleosome depleted region. It's harder to see here, but trust me, it's there. And a lot of this can be accounted for by sequence elements in uh, the promoter region, such as these poly DADT elements that exclude nucleosomes. But in vivo, there's this nice phasing of nucleosomes in the gene body that is absent in vitro. So Zhang et al. in 2011 did this nice experiment uh, to see if they could recapitulate this uh, phasing of nucleosomes. So what they did is they took this in vitro system where basically in this system you take naked DNA and nucleosomes and just figure out where the nucleosomes will bind on the naked DNA. There's nothing else there. To that, they added a whole cell extract, which contains all the transcription factors and chromatin uh, machineries of the cell, and then measured where the nucleosomes were located. And you can see that there's very little difference between in vitro. But then they added ATP to this, and then you can see that uh, the phasing observed in vivo is largely recapitulated. And this is presumably a result of ATP-dependent chromatin recombination. And these are large protein complexes that use the energy from ATP hydrolysis to basically they shove the DNA uh, into the nucleosome, creating this bulge. The bulge propagates around the nucleosome and on the other side. And that results in uh, the nucleosome shifting by about 10 base pairs. And they're used in the cell to move nucleosomes around the DNA. So, as I mentioned, poly-DADT tracts are a well-characterized promoter element in yeast. 
and they're thought to act by excluding nucleosomes. But if you look at these elements in a strand-specific way, you can see there's a very biased distribution of poly A's and T's. So here on this axis, I'm plotting the frequency of poly A's and poly T's across the promoter sequence and comparing that uh, to what's expected based on just the, the base content of the sequence. So you can see that at minus 100, there's a lot more poly T's than expected, and at minus 50, there's a lot more poly A's than expected. And given the model that these poly D, A, D, T tracks exclude nucleosomes simply because of their structure, that can't account for that, uh, for this strange distribution here, because you would expect that they would equally well exclude nucleosomes in either position. But because uh, these sequences are known to play a role in nucleosome occupancy, that was the first thing I looked, oh dear, blue screen. <laughs> All right. Uh, talk. I jump up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have this. this That's blue. Blue. That's two blue screens, by the way. <laughs> um, this is a different blue screen. <laughs> um, so do you want to talk right. talk or? I don't know. There's a lot of graphs in this talk. Luckily, no more heat maps. <laughs> oh, we got five minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it should be okay. It boots up pretty quickly. How about safe? Is it good time for a question? Yeah. So, uh, in your phased uh, in vivo versus not so phased in vitro, um, how did you organize the well, I didn't y organize axis. that, but, <laughs> but how was the uh, it's clustered. K means clustering, I think. Okay. Yeah, so it's just grouping promoters with similar nucleosome structure together. And I was going to ask on that topic, um, are they only expressed genes, or are they present in the same way in expressed and unexpressed genes? I don't know if they were just showing expressed genes in that uh, heat map that I showed, but in general, uh, some promoters that are not expressed do not have the nucleus. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. This somewhat sequence dependent positioning. Like, can you do something like a Fourier transform in the genome? Do you see anything that's the right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I forget which paper looked at that, but I believe if you do. Uh, something like that, you can see a periodicity of uh, uh, like on like four years or, or ten base pairs on four years. Yeah, I think it goes at like ten base pairs. The spacing of the two so. All right, we're almost back online here. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sorry to get to your money, money slide. Yeah. Bad timing. I don't think this computer has ever crashed before. <laughs> Good question. Oh, this is going to sound really silly, but what's the nucleus of stuff? Uh, so it's an octomer of eight histone proteins, uh, two H2A, two H2B, two H3, two H4. They form this like uh, cylinder structure, and DNA is wrapped around it. And uh, basically that way, well, part of the reason for it is to package the genome so that you can fit, like, meters of DNA into a very small cell. The other reason is to prevent things like transcription factors from binding anywhere in the genome. So if there's a nucleosome covering the binding site for that transcription factor, it can't bind with this DNA. <laughs> Still Can you give a chalk talk for the remaining five minutes of your talk? Uh, it's it's back now. I just need to.
<laughs> on the server. So basically, I took here all the poly A sequences in the genome and aligned them and averaged the nucleosome occupancy around these sites, uh, both in vitro in green and in vivo in black here. And you can see in vitro it looks more or less symmetrical, and both in vivo and in vitro you can see there's a nice nucleosome to big region on the poly A, which is what you'd expect. But in vivo here, you can see there's a five prime bias to the nucleosome free region uh, upstream of the poly A site. And there's this well positioned nucleosome there. And if you take the same data for poly P sequences, which actually just amounts to mirror imaging uh, the data here, you can appreciate how relatively symmetrical uh, it is in vitro, but how biased it is on. Um, uh, in, in vivo. So next I looked to see if uh, chromatin remodelers could be responsible. So uh, this is the same data I showed before where whole cell extract was added but no ATP. And you can see that looks very much like the in vitro data. But when they add ATP, now suddenly you see this uh, five prime bias to the nucleosome free region and the upstream nucleosome. So it looks from all this like there is some uh, bias, some strand bias to nucleosome occupancy around poly A elements. And next I wanted to look at uh, how this makes sense in terms of, are we going to wait till the end for questions or what? Of course, but uh, no, I think we should sort of flow. Okay, let's flow through it. Anyway, so there's, so, these promoters, again, have this poly T followed by poly A bias. So I wanted to see if different arrangements of poly A's and poly T's uh, would have different effects on nucleosome occupancy. So this is in vitro here. So what I did in this plot is find all instances of a poly A motif followed by a poly A motif separated by, in this case, 20 to 50 base pairs of intervening DNA and also poly T followed by A and A followed by T and, and averaged uh, the occupancy around these elements. So in vitro there's very little difference between these and they look symmetrical. Whereas in vivo it's a totally different story. So these are the same exact loci but now we're just looking at in vivo data. So you can see that uh, for poly A followed by poly A the whole uh, distribution here is asymmetrical around the motifs, whereas uh, poly T followed by poly A forms this uh, relatively strong nucleosome depleted region, and a poly A followed by a poly T doesn't form much of a nucleosome depleted region. Uh, and the, a similar trend can be seen at uh, higher spacing, so 91 to 140 base pairs here. Now poly A followed by poly T contains a nucleosome, whereas poly T followed by poly A uh, has these two well-positioned nucleosomes surrounding a nucleosome depleted region. At even higher spacings, now they all can contain a nucleosome. So basically what I think is happening here is you have these nucleosomes bound to the DNA, and you have chromatin remodelers moving them around. In the case where it collides with a poly A sequence, this acts like a kind of turnstile and prevents translocation of the nucleosome over the poly A sequence from the five prime side only. From the three prime side, the nucleosome is able 
to or relatively more able to translocate across uh, these sequence elements. And for the case of a single poly A, that results in this well-positioned nucleosome upstream of the poly A and the less well-positioned nucleosome downstream. And with uh, the different arrangements of poly Ts and poly As, these can also be accounted for uh, with this model, but it's a lot more complex uh, because of the different spacings and stuff. But basically, for poly T followed by poly A, when it's a, a low uh, gap here, so these two nucleosomes are able to move in towards that nucleosome-free region over these poly A and poly T elements. And now there's not enough space for a nucleosome to actually form in here. Whereas for greater distances, that one uh, can hold a nucleosome. And so this accounts for why uh, yeast has a preference for poly E followed by poly A, and they're usually spaced a lot more closely than this. Uh, so in conclusion, poly A sequences result in an asymmetrical <coughs> arrangement of nucleosomes on uh, the DNA, and uh, the cell uses this to uh, give its promoter architecture to keep nucleosomes out. Uh, there are still some unresolved questions here, though, like whether the specificity actually lies in the nucleosome or the chromatin remodeler, because both are possible with this model. And figure out if there's a specific chromatin remodeler that's responsible. As well, it'd be really interesting to see if you made a model of nucleosome occupancy that takes this into account. Now, how much more of the in vivo occupancy can you account for? So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my supervisor, Tim Hughes, and everyone else in the lab, as well as funding. I'd be happy to take any more questions. Let me get one until Paul sets up. There was a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I've been trying to read the exact paper in the meantime to get my answer, but poly A is how many A? Uh, in my case, I'm using A of five, so five A's in a row. And so if it's four, it doesn't count as poly A. That's correct. And if it's five, it does. Yes. I looked at other uh, definitions, and they're all pretty consistent. What's special about what happens at five that doesn't happen at four? Uh, nothing really, but it's just a convenient way of defining it. So do you get it the same? Do you get the same outcome if you change the definition of what constitutes poly A? Well, it gets noisier and noisier as you get down to one, but you do see the same trend for both higher and lower definitions of poly A up until you reach like A. At which point you see nothing.